All right. Uh, welcome to NFT Hype. Uh, thank you, Jacob, for joining me today. Uh, Jacob Eisenberg of the NBA Top Shot Project, which is kicking butt on so many levels, uh, not to mention some of the uh, great production values that you guys have for the moments that you came up with. Uh, uh, are you able to tell us, Jacob? Well, first off, welcome. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. I'm actually going to put on headphones real quick. Okay, cool. Well, Jacob, who's your favorite player? So historically, my favorite player all time is Pop Pablo Prigioni of the New York Knicks. He only had a, a limited stint with the Knicks, but it was the golden age of my Knicks fandom. We actually made the playoffs. Um, and then if not Pablo, uh, Draymond Green. I am a diehard Michigan State Spartan fan. And I, I remember when Draymond was the pudgy freshman who got six minutes a game in uh, their tournament run and just seeing him kind of go from ninth man on a good team as a freshman to becoming uh, All-American as a senior and just kind of continuously proving the doubters wrong. Um, I just, I love the energy he brings and he's quite a controversial character. I understand it, but <laughs> I think he's a good guy and I think his heart's in the right place. And I think he's just a savant on the court, uh, whether he can shoot or not at this point. Uh, remains to be seen come playoff time, but he's uh, he's certainly uh, electric when he's when he's cooking. Oh yeah, good 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 picks. I wouldn't have suspected it, but that's awesome. Now, because you said that, it, it just automatically made me think of my childhood growing up playing basketball. Like you, you must have been a baller, right? I played. I was what we would call a rec league all star. I played a lot of rec. Uh, I played in the, the Temple League in my, my county. Um, never played for our high school team. I was never quite good enough, though I, I, I would say, you know, I, I could have maybe rode the pine as a senior, maybe <laughs> maybe gotten five minutes of action over the course of the entire season. Um, but I, I was, uh, I don't think I had the dedication to, to play at that level or uh, the college level for sure. Oh yeah. And, um... Well, I mean, same here, pretty much my story. I, I wasn't good enough to make the high school team, but I definitely played in rec league and played on, on, on uh, courts outside and um, loved three on three and uh, half court and um, just loved all that stuff. Um, what was your favorite position? Uh, I like to play point guard. So uh, Pr Prigioni is my favorite player. I try to model my game a lot after players like him. Um, Lamar Odom was a guy that I really enjoyed watching because I, I was always fairly tall and lanky, um, but pretty decent ball handler, pretty decent passer. So um, that point forward kind of role was something I always kind of gravitated toward um, on defense. I would, I would tend to play big man, which was ironic because I was always a twig, but uh, <laughs> it was, uh, you know, I, I think the most realistic NBA comparison I, I could give to myself is probably like, Sean Livingston without an elite mid-range game. <laughs> Maybe. Hey, so far, I've noticed you've been using a lot of West Coast players. Is that because you grew up out there? No, I'm actually born and raised in New York, live okay. in Brooklyn uh, to this date. Um, obviously, the Warriors were such a formational team in, over the past decade. And uh, I try to stick to players that I think everyone will know or will at, have at least heard of with Sean Livingston, of course, winning multiple titles. Um, but growing up, like that comp that I got from friends was I was Jared Jeffries and that like I was pretty good defensively, could kind of guard all these positions, but certainly um, didn't have much of a perimeter shot. I think over time, like in college, I, I really developed that and became an actually solid player. Um, but yeah, I, I think... The Knicks don't don't inspire much as far as <laughs> historically. So when I'm looking at who I tried to model my game after, certainly Warriors players were the ones that kind of okay. were more. Yeah, yeah. The the Knicks players. I mean, I can remember Charles Oakley. He's a good one. He was on the Raptors as well too. So yes, sir. Yeah, he's a good guy. Um, yeah. Um, so it takes me back to playing. Also, it's just funny how all of this stuff comes up into our adulthood life uh, in our adulthood and um, just in the way things have evolved over the years with digital collectibles this is just like a should be like pure playground and fun for you when you wake up every morning isn't it 
Yeah, it's it's awesome. Um, you know, you you've been monitoring Top Shot for months, and I think you can attest that the past maybe five weeks or is just a different kind of stratosphere from where it was in 2020. Um, but it's awesome to see so many basketball fans, so many collectors, um, not necessarily even diehard fans, getting into the space and, and really understanding kind of the long-term value of these collectibles and enjoying kind of obsessively like scouring the market, trying to find outlier deals and <laughs> trying to find, you know, the right serial number, trying to find plays, be it, um, you know, obviously the Jersey match and the first mint are the, the most popular, but I, I, we're starting to see some collectors really target players' birth years or the year they were drafted. You know, oh, yeah. there, there are a lot of different angles to play. So um, it's been really cool. It's been really rewarding to see the community really uh, just take off. And I, I think as far as the collector base goes, we have 30,000 moment owners right now. And wow. When we look at kind of the the space and just the how big the NBA is as a worldwide brand, we're talking about literally more than a, a billion fans around right. the world. So our first 30,000, uh, we're really excited for all of them because they're in super early. And we, we think that there's a lot more basketball fans to come to the platform in due time. Yeah, good call on that one. Uh, 30,000 out of a billion is not a lot at all. Uh, talk about like from 2020 to 2021, what changed there? Like what happened there in terms of yeah. growth in your gut, in your mind? Yeah, I think it was a confluence of maybe four or five different things. I'll rattle them off. Um, the first thing that was something we had been kind of excited about since like, you know, October open beta, we knew we had a deal with Tyler Hero lined up. And we knew that he was going to add a lot of brand legitimacy if we could use his likeness on the site and he's promoting it externally. That just is a feather in our cap that we're legit uh, on top of the fact that obviously we're partnered with the NBA and the Players Association and, and our investors include Andre Iguodala and JaVale McKee and Aaron nice. Gordon. Um, we, we knew that just having a player endorsing the product would be a big step in the right direction. Um, we launched a showcase contest. Uh, a showcase is a feature on Top Shot where you can put together a, essentially a highlight reel of your favorite moments. Um, we created a showcase contest and we created basically a stimulus package for our economy where if you bought your first pack, you were gifted $5 in credit to then spend toward building a showcase. If you build your showcase, you get 10 likes on your showcase on Top Shot, you get an additional $15. So we created feedback loops that really got collectors hooked on the collecting and the, the kind of st the strategy behind putting together the best showcase to get likes. Um, so that with Hero, um, that with the $5 back on your first pack, um, and obviously, needless to say, the biggest factor of it all, the season starting, right? Uh, when, yeah. when the off seasons, this is universal in trading card space, this is universal in fantasy sports, if it's the off season, people move on to football or they move on to the, the other sports that are in the calendar. When the NBA came back, the confluence of all of these things hitting at once was really kind of uh, powerful for momentum. And, uh, and then last but not least, I would say getting some influencers in the space. So the Fantasy Labs guys, Jonathan Bales bought the John Morant for $35,000. That was, and then he wrote an, an article basically self self-aware saying I bought a highlight that I could watch on YouTube for $35,000. Here's why. And I think through that blog, um, we've just seen a total kind of wave of fantasy sports players coming to yeah. top shot, understanding kind of where the opportunities are. And I think it's a little different than fantasy sports in that uh, this, this is, I look at it like an arcade, right? Like I would never encourage someone to, come to Top Shot with money that they don't have to spend to spend on Top Shot, similar to an arcade in that sense. But I think there's a, it's a lot of fun. Um, everyone that's collecting is having fun doing so. And there might be opportunities to find good deals in the market, but um, it's certainly uh, entertainment first and foremost in my eyes. Oh yeah, just uh, just as if, uh, I don't know if you collected sports cards when you were a kid, but um, yeah. Absolutely. 
I mean, we, we definitely wanted to open a pack and get a, a good player. Um, but this just kind of takes it to the another, another level. Um, talk about the, the design of your packs. Like I'm just seeing it in your background there. Who did that? That that's, that's just an amazing job. Yeah. Uh, we have world-class designers on our team. Uh, it, it's, I'm inspired every day to work with so many great people on our team from the designers to, uh, our product people. Um, our, our design team in particular is, uh, fairly un uncommon in the blockchain space and tech space in that it's, uh, female led. So yeah. our head of design, our head of top shot design, all, all, all women. And, uh, they've really done a great job in kind of, uh, making, the pack art really kind of ad addictive to kind of yeah. like you can tell be it a cosmic set or the finals legendary set people really gravitate toward the pack art that they think that resonates with them so um in addition to obviously the great highlight in the moment what makes these nfts so cool is that it's not just the highlight it's not just the serial number it's all the, the collectible details within the moment and the artwork that you get as you collect it as well yeah it, it's uh maybe an idea for the future but it's a shame that you we you guys uh burn those packs huh or, or sort of they, they go away it would be kind of cool to have them uh you know stay with you because they're definitely a work of art on its own i'll tell you that yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, and we're looking into certain ideas around being able to reopen a pack that you've already opened. Um, we've had some bugs in recent weeks uh, in which a pack might get delivered and the, the opening experience is compromised in some capacity. So um, we're, we're, we're working hard to address that in creative ways so that if someone opens a pack and it's not the per most perfect first experience, they'll have uh, another opportunity, so to speak. Oh, yeah. uh, but that's in, the, that's in the roadmap. I don't know what a timeline for that would look like necessarily. But uh, yeah, I, th I think to your point, like this artwork is awesome. And while you get it on the moment itself, I think, you, you know, just having a, a, a ledger of all of the packs you've bought and opened would be a cool kind of touch to the Oh earth. yeah, absolutely. Uh, those things are just beautiful, especially that hollow icon one. Um, but yeah, some of the early one, earlier ones that you had too as well, they just look so real and you just like want to rip them open. Something about them, right? Yeah. Um, and when we did the hero uh, promotion, he, he shared some pack artwork and we got overwhelming uh, responses and troll comments in, in his Instagram post saying how they look like condoms. <laughs> we're aware we uh we actually think that could help on the virality sake yeah uh, you know, I, it, it's uh i think it's a, a unique twist on what a, a trading card pack looks like and uh certainly because these moments are square um or at least the the thumbnails are square it, it fits pretty well but um potentially the pack artwork will be three-dimensional um it's already somewhat three-dimensional but uh i think there are other layers to that to come still Okay, well, just don't have a Magnum pack anytime soon. <laughs> uh, well, let me write that down. It's important. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so what's coming up? Well, uh, first off, let's regress a little bit. W what is your role on the team? Sure. So I, I'm, I lead our community um, and I have a lot of help um, because it takes a village to raise a community that's uh, yeah. growing as quickly as ours. Um, but I would say day to day, I am managing our team that oversees our Twitter, our Instagram, our Discord. Um, yeah. I send out, I'd say 75 to 80% of our emails. Um, my boss, Katie, sends out the emails when we do something wrong and kind of helps. Uh, she, she's a wordsmith uh, for sure. So she, she kind of helps in the very kind of uh, stressful situation, so to speak. But generally, if you're getting emails about pack drops, you're getting emails about um, what's going on in the community, be it a dev diary or a uh, community roundup, those are generally coming from me. Uh, I'm now doing a daily office hours in our Discord. Um, so just kind of trying to be a man of the people, so to speak. And um, 
historically, you know, I have a lot of experience working with influencers. Uh, I covered the NBA uh, as a locker room kind of journalist for a few years. So um, I'm, I'm slowly but surely transitioning into kind of presenting myself more as an external champion of the community in maybe a uh, quasi influencer capacity where I can speak on behalf of the team, um, do podcasts like this one, uh, yeah. which I'm very appreciative of you having me on. Uh, and yeah, I think just generally speaking, like I love hoops, love the NBA, have always obsessed over the NBA, I can like remember as like maybe a, a fifth grader obsessing over Theo Ratliff's expiring oh, yeah. contract and just wondering like who's going to try to acquire that. So to be able to kind of... Wait, he was on Philly, right? Was that the Philly contract? Yeah. So he was on Philly, got traded for Dikembe Mutombo. Mutombo went to Philly. So Ratliff went to the Hawks um, okay. and Mutombo uh, won Defensive Player of the Year, helped Allen Iverson get to the finals, of course. Couldn't quite get over the hump of beating Shaq. I remember we had, oh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, I remember we had him uh, on our fantasy team and we used to call him Blockliff because <laughs> he would just get all the blocks. Like he's just look at that column and it'd be like seven blocks. I was like, wow, you know? Yeah. We need a moment of his one day, but uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I say that more because I, I always like thought my dream job would be working as a general manager. And I think that's what pretty much every basketball fan at yeah. one point has thought. Um, and, you know, I, I did consulting for some teams. I am close with a few uh, executives around the league. Close might be overstating it, but I'm friendly and certainly on, an, on a first name basis and can, can email them. But um, I would just say like dating back to like very early childhood, I was playing a lot of NBA Live 98, playing a lot of NBA Live 99. I learned players kind of contracts and ratings that way um so just kind of had a rolodex of information in my head about who was good who wasn't and that's kind of always stick stuck with me so i think for for our team we have a lot of casual nba fans for sure um i like kind of putting my finger on the or a thumb on the scale so to speak and uh <laughs> weigh in on oh i think we should put this rookie in our next rookie debut pack because x y and z um, this right. guy is not quite as kind of uh, highly touted, despite him putting up more points per, per game than the other guy, you know, things like that. I always like uh, having a little bit of input on the editorial side, because I think, you know, at the end of the day, people, people want to just have the best experience possible. And I, I think that we're constantly iterating on which moments we get. And uh, as the past five weeks have really uh, taken off, we're starting to have a little bit more ability to uh, constructively kind of feedback with the league and players association to get even better moments into the pipeline. Oh, so you actually make the call into the player and say, hey, can you do a slam dunk tonight? And then, uh, <laughs> no, no, that's not how it works. Yeah, we did tell Tyler Hero to perform well in the playoffs so we could use his <laughs> finals moments. That was all part of the script. Yeah, uh, that's cool, man. I, I love that you you you're you have those connections within the league too, because yeah, it just puts you closer to the ground, and and just knowing and having that knowledge there is just brings a lot to the team for you for sure. Yeah, I haven't tapped into any of those contacts yet. I think uh, it'll be cool when when they hear about Top Shot organically, and then yeah. we can kind of chop it up from there. Um, yeah, but... wouldn't it be cool? I don't know if it's been done already, but. Um probably the uh, some of your investors but uh, the the ones who uh the players have they started collecting any t moments yet so bogdan bogdanovich of the atlanta hawks is our first player to actually own their own moment nice. uh, they bought he bought his uh legendary moment from last season when he was on the kings i think it was a hollow mm mmxx so 2020 um and I know that other players are starting to come to the platform. Uh, Josh Green, rookie of the Dallas Mavericks, uh, his agent and him opened up a pack just no last way. week. And lo and behold, they pulled the Josh Green moment. So no way, did they really? That's what are the chances? Uh, really can't make this stuff up, but that's, <laughs> that's, that was exciting for us to see. He posted it on his Instagram story. I think his fans are probably like, what the hell is this? Yeah. <laughs> Without much context, but... Uh, 
Um, and, and so that leads into sort of like the type of person to come into the community. What are you seeing so far? Like, is it uh, traditional collectors? Um, yeah, if you, I, I, and obviously it's a mix of everyone and anyone, but can yeah. you see any trends there? Yeah, I think it's kind of four or five different buckets. Uh, recently, the overwhelming bucket has been daily fantasy sports players. Okay. Um, I, again, that Jonathan Bales blog talking about why he purchased the John Morant, and certainly uh, in recent weeks, we've seen Jeremy Levine buy a $100,000 Zion moment. Okay. Uh, so I think in, in that specific realm of uh, Twitter, a lot of daily fantasy sports players have just come crashing in and some of them are in it for a quick buck. Uh, and that's not kind of what Top Shot's all about. Some are in it for kind of long haul, which we're really excited about. Now, what is it about the fantasy players that want to come to this? What do you yeah, think I think fantasy sports players uh, for years have all thought that they would be the best general manager in the world, right? Right. And there's something cool about being able to put your money where your mouth is quite literally and say, I think Jason Tatum is going to be a superstar if he's not already considered oh, a superstar. So it's like speculating on the future potential value of the, the player. Yeah. So there's the daily fantasy sports element of like, you're looking at the calendar. Ooh, I see the Sixers are playing on national TV three times this week. I think Ben Simmons moments are going to go up in value. So there's certainly that. But then there's also the keeper league element of like, I think LaMelo Ball is a future Hall of Famer. I want his first assist because 40 years from now, there's no telling how coveted that moment is going to be in the world. Oh, so yeah. there's that and, angle too. And you kind of picking up on something that I sort of naturally did when I was looking at stuff on the market. I obviously wanted to get the younger players with a, you know, potential on the upside and um, ones that have nice moments. Do you, yeah, so I, I picked up uh, and I haven't followed the NBA in the last couple of years just because I've been so head down in this NFT world, but um, I got uh, Josh Okogi. What do you know about him? So he's Nigerian, uh, really great defender, Georgia Tech product. Um, he had a surprisingly strong rookie season. Um, I was not super high on him coming out of college because he was not much of a shooter. And in my eyes, if you're just a great defender there are there are a lot of people you can pick up brooklyn nets just picked up iman shumpert for that role off the waiver um, off the free agent circuit so um okoji is an excellent dunker really athletic great great defender um minnesota is of course just not the, the the best team these days um and i think with them picking up Malik Beasley and trading for D'Angelo Russell and drafting Anthony Edwards and drafting Jarrett Culver last year. There's just a crowded kind of glut of players in that backcourt. Okay. Um, I think Okoji is uh, an interesting guy. And I think I wouldn't be surprised to see him move on from Minnesota at some point and end up on a contender playing oh, yeah. the uh, seventh or eighth man role as similar to maybe what KCP did for the Lakers last year as just kind of like a guy that, came in primarily as a defender and then expanded the role. But yeah, I think it's tough. Minnesota's defense is just so bad. So even someone like Okoji, who by reputation is a really good defender, it's uh, it's hard for one player on a team to make such a defensive impact unless you're maybe like Rudy Gobert or Joel Embiid, who can kind of be just a rim protector first and foremost. Wow. Uh, that's amazing. What a, what a, that's worth price admission right there. That's awesome. Now I know what to do with my Okoji. I'll, I, I'm a, I like to buy, I keep him uh, buy low and sell high. So uh, I'll wait till he gets traded to the Lakers and then probably move him. Um, what is it about these uh, series one? How much, what was the supply? Do you, do you know what the total supply of series one uh, was? Uh, as far as how many different moments we minted in series one yeah, yeah. just that, like you know ballpark or ball ballpark is high three figures i don't think we had more than a thousand i think we have about a thousand moments on our platform right now um so I, I think high three figures um circulating count obviously significantly lower on all of those series one moments than anything in series two um that isn't 
uh, rare or legendary. Um, so people were able to pick up, you know, limited edition commons that are minted up to a thousand uh, in series one and in series two, it's quite possible that the rare moment will be minted up to 999, just like the conference finals packs were. So um, still value in series one, I think as collectors kind of speculate on the long-term future of Top Shot, there's certainly uh, just like any comic book first edition or any mm -hmm. trading card first edition, series one will always have weight um but i also with that being said i think series two is also super early in top shot so people that have come to the ballpark uh come to the stadium so to speak are in good hands because again thirty thousand people right now and, and certainly uh certainly many many more millions that like the nba and can understand why a lebron james dunk his valuable in the same yeah. way that maybe other crypto assets are valuable. Yeah, fair enough. Um, will you guys ever do, uh, like you mentioned, Theo Ratliff there, would you guys ever do past moments or is that uh, off the table for now? Uh, it's not off the table. We actually did um, one historic pack to date. Um, oh, that, was, okay. that was uh, the run it back set from 2013-14. Okay. Uh, we did that set to get Giannis's rookie moment to top shot, among other players. Dennis Schroeder had their rookie, had his rookie moment. Uh, Steven Adams had his rookie moment. Um, but yeah, I think uh, we plan to actually do another run it back drop in the next month and a half, maybe. And that will include um, players Hall of Famers debuts on Top Shot, um, a bunch of them actually. So we're really excited about it. The year, I can't be too specific, but the year is between 2005 and 2010. So these will be the earliest moments on Top Shot to date. No way, 2005 to 2010. Wow, a lot of good stuff going on there. Yeah, we're, we're pumped. Uh, I, I can't say it enough. I had quite a few Hall of Famers that uh, are already in the Hall of Fame are going to make their Top Shot debut. So, oh uh, wow! If you look at you know, speaking of speaking of which, Vince Carter had some great last moment. What, what was why was his card so hot? Yeah, um, well, I think I think you put it well. It was literally his last moment of his career. It was a three pointer, and I think on top of the NBA significance of Vince Carter, a future Hall of Famer, his last play of his career being a three that he drains can also think of it in the cultural relevancy of that was essentially the last shot in NBA history pre-COVID, right? That oh, was yeah. that night was the Rudy Gobert night where they they basically closed up the season uh, or closed up the season as we knew it pre-bubble. And so if you look at just the history books, March 11th is always going to have a significance in the basketball world as kind of like unprecedented territory so it was a confluence of you know vince carter's last career bucket covid hitting and that's always just gonna have relevance and him being a hall of famer him being a hall of famer for sure i think he's a slam dunk for that yeah unless he already got inducted i'm not sure so you can't get inducted to the hall of fame i believe it's five years past okay. retirement so you need to be retired for five years before you're first eligible but i think there was a lot of uh discussion about whether he'd be a hall of famer uh kind of closer to when he was like with the mavericks maybe five or six years ago and the fact that he put up five and five or six really steady good years as a role player it just sealed the deal for sure that this guy went from being the next michael jordan in some circles when he was early with toronto to being a very very solid player for new jersey for quite a few years to you know playing with Orlando to Phoenix. I, I think I can probably get the sequence of all the teams Vince Carter played for, but I'm not going to try because I think they're, he played for too many. I, I, I can say with certainty that I'm rattling them off. We go Toronto oh. to New Jersey yeah. to Orlando, where he got traded for Courtney Lee, to Phoenix, to, I want to say, Dallas, to... 
Memphis to Sacramento. Did back, he really? Maybe back to Memphis. I don't, I don't quote me on that. Then he definitely went to Atlanta to, to wrap up the career. It was Sacramento to Atlanta. I know that for sure. Well, I'm pretty sure him and his mom still have a parking spot at the ACC in Toronto. So I, I don't know. He, he's like, he, he could have been, well, I mean, I think, I don't know if he will go into the Hall of Fame, probably as a Raptor. I'm hoping so, but uh, yeah. yeah, we'll see. He definitely had, he made a mark on the city for sure. And put us, he put Toronto on the map, so. Yeah, it was too bad that he had somewhat of a acrimonious departure. Um, I think, you know, he would be the first to say he would do things differently if he could. Oh, um, yeah. But everything works out. Yeah, and, he, and I think at the time, like Vince played his butt off and he he just didn't have the support on the team. Like even his cousin left. And I think that was the, the, the kind of deal that kind of let him out of, the, you know, he wanted to leave after that. But Right. Yeah, I mean, just imagine if, Tracy and Vince stuck together. What would right. what, 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 what have been? What could have been? Well, yeah, what it could have, should have. Um, but I'm glad that uh, Toronto did finally get a championship with um, Kawhi. It was just an epic season, like all throughout. I, I didn't even think we were going to win that Golden State series until uh, literally in the fourth quarter of, of that game because anything could have happened. Yeah, and... I don't want to take anything away from Toronto because what an achievement to win. Uh, I think the only other team that did something so drastic in the off season to have such a quick turnaround uh, from my recollection is uh, the Celtics big three with KG and Ray oh, Allen. Yeah. Um, obviously like people are going to say, Oh, well, Kevin Durant went to golden state and they won, but that's a little different. I think we all know that. Um, but yeah, I mean, golden state, man, just such a, so you, you never want to win knowing that there's like going to be an asterisk tied to well, what if Clay didn't get hurt? What if KD yeah. didn't get hurt? Um, and but that's KD, not taking anything away. KD rushed himself back though. He did. And, yeah. and that was, uh, I, I feel for KD and obviously he paid the price of rushing because he, uh, you know, had, he tore his Achilles and yeah. that, that's really devastating. I think, uh, you know, he certainly, felt pressure, um, be it, you know, direct pressure from his team or internal pressure, because he knows that he can help his team win another championship. And that goes into his legacy. Yeah. Well, um, that, but even, that even with clay, I think they, you know, clay got hurt, I think in the fourth quarter of that game six, and he was about to go into one of those classic clay overdrive. <laughs> That's what I was afraid of. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I, I, it's such a bummer. I love Clay so much as a player. I, I really want to see Draymond, Steph, Clay have one more kind of go at it and be it with James Wiseman, be it whether they use James Wiseman to acquire another star. They obviously have Minnesota's pick this coming season. So oh, a yeah. lot of interesting stuff there. Yeah. And uh, Kawhi really elevated, like when I saw him make that shot in the, in, in the Eastern conference, I was like, this guy's the new, MJ or something because he's he's just amazing and just to be so clutch is just something that was unseen in the Toronto scene for sure yeah absolutely I think uh what a great series I mean yeah. obviously strife with injuries but hats I'm very happy for Masai uh it it, it it's a testament to him being a little bit daring and betting on himself and I would love to see more teams do it because in, in this era of basketball, it's kind of no one wants to be on the treadmill of med mediocrity. So everyone's yeah. either tanking or trying to win it all. And uh, I would love more teams to go for it every year. Yeah. And uh, he had to break up the two best friends there, Kyle and um, DeRozan. And that was a huge, you know, rip apart. And to bring in that and they won, it's just amazing. So, yeah. Anyways, um, what's new? on the radar for for top shot or is there anything that you can give us what's coming we we heard about some new throwback packs or uh yeah. but what else you got guys coming up coming up yeah so the run it back packs uh we're really excited about we have some other rare packs coming soon um we have plans for a legendary pack probably about a month out from now obviously getting pack drops secured and strong and uh stable oh, yeah is our top priority as far as the engineering goes. Uh, so features that we know are on our wish list and we plan to add soon, they're just taking a backseat until we get the, the drops working perfectly yeah. or 
perfect is too strong, but working really, really well, I should say. Um, and then on the kind of all hands on deck side, like we have such a backlog of tickets. So literally everyone from our CEO to our marketing team, to a community like myself, to business development, to HR, we're all just learning Zendesk, hopping into the queues and trying to help <laughs> because, um, you know, we're only as strong as our community and, uh, we, we have quite a few tickets to work through to, uh, you know, address problems that have come up over the past month or so. Talk about that statement a little bit. What does that mean? They were only as uh, strong as our community. Like how, how why is it? I saw the flow a blockchain release a, an article about how to build a community or so uh, on that topic. What does that mean to you being, you know, head of community? Yeah, I think, look, uh, in any economy uh, or ecosystem like Top Shot, where it's predicated on supply and demand, uh, you need people to, as more people come, the, the community members collections in theory become more coveted because there's a very scarce supply and there will be increased demand. So I think like for us, we're only as strong as our community. I, I mean that to say, if someone has a ticket and they had a question, they're emailing us as kind of a last resort because they don't know where else to turn. Um, and if they don't hear from us for two, three weeks, because we have such a backlog, that's not, that's not meeting our standards as trying to live up to our, our community. So um, that has happened in recent weeks. And I think there are a handful of reasons why it, it, it came to that. I think primarily it's scaling, right? Like yeah. it's much, much easier for hindsight 2020 to say we should add we should have more customer support people. Like clearly, yes, we all agree on that now, but five weeks ago, that was not the case. And uh, uh, you're a, a business owner yourself, you know, like adding someone to a team, uh, you wanna do that with full confidence that you're adding the right person and you don't wanna make a decision based on false urgency. So um, there is absolutely urgency on our team to scale up, um, but, as I mentioned, everyone is kind of pitching in all hands on deck to, to help out until we find the right people to kind of work on the team. And uh, cool. so the, the urgency is real. I don't mean to dismiss that by saying false urgency, but I think rather than adding someone that we're lukewarm on, I'd rather, uh, I'd rather, you know, contribute, help out as much as I can, the rest of our team help out as much as we can, bide time until the perfect candidate comes our way. Oh, that's a good answer. Hey, just one thing I was curious about. Um, feature wise, uh, a lot of people have been asking, myself included, uh, about trading and selling packs. When is that feature going to be coming? Yeah, so right now, uh, we're instituting a mission, vision, values, plus rules to our Discord. Uh, one of the rules is explicitly prohibiting off market trading. Okay. Um, the reason being, we're seeing so many scammers impersonating uh, members of the community, um, impersonating referees in our Discord, impersonating mods, impersonating myself. Um, so it's just not safe right now for people to trade. trade. Um, and so what I would say is after we fix the issues around pack drops, mm -hmm. <clears throat> We have a ton of great ideas, such as being able to list your unopened packs on the marketplace again, and that will come in due time. We just, uh, again, we're, we're trying to yeah, crawl so before things. we walk and walk before we run. So all these things are definitely on our roadmap and definitely things we're excited about, just uh, not quite uh, what we can do uh, until we get the other stuff right. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and for now, like I mean, we see so many Top Shot users on uh, my partner Crypto Slam's uh, website, and it goes back to that profile of the fantasy player. But you also have the pack rippers as well too. So there's all kinds of people in this community. Um, what do you? How do you use Crypto Slam? I'm using it pretty much every day to check how many moment owners are in our our community. Uh, when I'm talking to 
players or journalists or people in the space that are interested in learning more, I'm referring them to Crypto Slam and I'm basically just cherry picking like, okay, let's see in the last minute, ooh, that Zach Levine went for $720. Why is that? <laughs> that, that Marvin Bagley went for $12. Why is that? You know? Um, so I'm using Crypto Slam a lot there. Um, I love what you have built there. Really appreciative of it. And uh, we, we've talked before. I think like your ideas for the future there are really exciting and only going to make um, uh, make the, the Crypto Slam platform even more kind of useful for our community, which is great. Yeah. Uh, on, on for on that note, it's it's uh, Connie uh, Randy, who's 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 the founder of it, and he's just amazing. He's just uh, he, he's a collector himself and uh, he's done all this and I'm just happy to be a partner with him. So, yeah, uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, the, the other thing I have is that you gave me a pack to open. Uh, why don't we just share the screen real, real quick? Oh, actually, you know what? Um, we'll drop and, uh, and I'll probably open that on my own. That sounds great. Um, hey, I really appreciate you having me on, Johan. Uh, thanks so much.